I'm Greg Cummings, I'm Executive Director of the Gorilla Organization. Well, I've been doing gorilla conservation for 16 years. Um, almost to the day when I started, we've had some kind of political or military conflict around these habitats we're trying to protect. When I first started here, we found that people were quite ambivalent about these parks, and they believed that all national parks in Africa are owned by European royalty. That's how much of a gap there was between their day-to-day -day lives and our cause and interest. And so our projects have always been designed to partner with local organizations. That coupled with the fact that some of the most densely populated communities in Africa are also situated around these habitats led us to look for a more holistic approach that was going to take those problems into consideration. So in order to keep the, the, the whole thing focused on what we needed to do, as in protecting gorillas and protecting those habitats, we looked at the biggest threats to those habitats and considered what kind of projects we could do to tackle them. So for instance, we found that collecting water was a, a, a major threat to the gorillas. Children were in the forest early in the morning uh, and learned that there was this disadvantage that the children were not getting to school, they were, their, their grades were, were lower, they, 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 they weren't getting the same kind of results as if they were in school the whole time. The money to build the system is fundraised by the Goro organization. We give the money to our local partner called Arasi. Then Arasi employs local people to build the system. Right now we have been able to build 33 systems. And we are planning to build more for this year. We have set up an environment education project. With this project we have been able to set up 356 environment clubs within all schools around the volcanoes area. Among sustainable activities we have started, including these school gardens. These are onions, those are cabbages. They've been able to buy a, a VCR and a, a screen, a video screen. So from this harvest, you see, this is something very positive. Okay, these people are called marginalized people. In a partnership with a local NGO called AIMPO, we have launched a social integration program. We are trying to give hope to these people. See, it's like other indigenous communities globally where people are not recognized. People are, are being denied access. There is no access for education. There is no access for medical uh, assistance. Even within the societies, they are not recognized. They, there is no identity for themselves. So what we are trying to do is, you know, to, to bring them hope, you know, to bring back that hope by supporting them, by supporting their initiatives, by supporting their, you know, their activities so that they can also be proud of themselves. Of all the East African countries, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, Uganda is really at the forefront of being totally behind um, some of the environmental issues, green issues. They're at the forefront of organic farming in this region. Um, it's one of the things that points the pride for this country. Our belief or our conviction is that not only do these projects address what is on the people's hearts, but they stand high chances of being sustainable and owned by the locals themselves. Uh, we also found that people were in there to set up beehives and collect honey. So we intend to move our farmers from the traditional way of beekeeping to the modern way of beekeeping so that the incomes at household level are increased. Uh, thus improving the welfare of our farmers. The other project is the organic farming project. I train the extension workers who come down to the community <laughs> to train these farmers <laughs> in livestock management, composting, uh, fruit growing. We have 100 farmers. This lady has been just in training for only six months, but she has put in place what she has learned. 
our plan is to continue training these farmers as they train others and until we go on international market, we shall not stop. Environmental education is implemented by the wildlife clubs of Uganda. Wildlife clubs are good for the schools just because they should learn more about the animals, they learn how to conserve the environment, and it is good for them as children and for the community as a whole. So we took all these main threats and reasons for the encroachment and designed a program that would address each one of those and, and find ways to, at, you know, at best, provide alternative livelihoods. Um, but at the very least, make people aware of the impact they were having on these habitats and also aware of the value of the habitats remaining intact. A lot of people think that um, coming to visit the gorillas is, is a double-edged sword, that ecotourism is a double-edged sword, that once you let people into these areas of natural beauty, they'll ultimately destroy it. And that's not true. Um, uh, you take the, the gorilla tourism in Rwanda, for example, and it will only take 35 people a day can go in and see those gorillas. So that's not a lot of impact in an area that's the size of, say, Washington, D.C. And it's essential, and it really is working, to have some kind of economic benefit from keeping these rare endangered apes alive. I like to think that our organization offers this almost unique opportunity of connecting ordinary people who want to support the cause with the ordinary people out here who are doing their best to make it happen.